it's not that the industry needs AI necessarily, it's just that AI oftentimes helps automate those processes that need to be automated in healthcare. The telehealth is that helping patients is not only about financial outcomes. We have this paradox. You have great people willing to do the work and then you have this bureaucracy, this monopolies that are controlling the industry. And so the question is, what do we do about it? The physician should be the final decision maker. Why invest into system updates and te technological advances if, in their mind, providers have nowhere to go? The AI is a kiss, kiss of death if you're a startup trying to become a public company. We're gonna take over the industry. Um, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna help everybody. It's, it's gonna be great. Hi, and welcome to our digital health interviews. Traditionally, I'd like to remind you to subscribe to our channel to find out more about digital health. And today in our episode, I wanna talk about some really complicated, often controversial and unpopular topics. And the, pers the best person to do this would be our today's guest, Sergei Polavikov. Hi, Sergei. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm good, Alex. I, I really have lots of topics to discuss, so let's not waste time and let's get to our interview. But before I start asking my questions, tell us a bit about your background. What are the main insights into your professional journey? Absolutely, thanks for having me. My background uh, started many years ago um, in my deep interest, I would say, in math, statistics, um, you know, just playing with numbers. And, you know, my dad is a professor, so from early years, I was interested in formulas and how things work and, you know, mathematical proofs. And so, um, you know, back in my home country, Belarus, I did some formal training in mathematics and statistics and later got into AI and machine learning. Um, and uh, when I came to the U.S., um, the applications of my knowledge were in fields like economics and finance and fintech, um, where there is a lot of um, great people um, using mathematical and machine learning models to um, enhance the industry, to make things better. And um, last few years, last almost five years, I wandered into healthcare digital health. Um, with my partner, we started a startup called WellAI, which is still going strong. Um, and the idea was just to help patients, customers with getting direct information from medical literature um, on the topics that interest them, which most of the time is the daily problems they have, the symptoms, the diseases. And so we, we actually have an app, I can actually show you a little bit, which is still functional and, you know, customers use it. Uh, initially, it was an app that was direct to consumer, but um, it's a very difficult area. There are a lot of issues like legal and, um, you know, who are we really reaching, you know, are people going to use it at, at, at um, face value. And so now we're working with businesses, providers and uh, clinics. Uh, but initially, it all started with a simple app that uh, accesses the database and essentially gives you answers back, and it's in interactive form. So it's, 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 it's a simple app where I can start talking to it. Hi, I woke up this morning and I have a terrible headache. Here are symptoms I heard you were experiencing. Headache, is everything correct? So it reads through a lot of information and basically just focuses on the problem area like headache in this case and then it goes through uh i'm, I'm saying yes sensitivity to light. and then it started asking questions now questions are targeted based on the data set of medical studies so if i say headache it kind of knows with high probability what's typical other uh symptoms or other questions are useful to ask and after uh, 10, 15 questions, it uh, narrows down to particular probable diagnosis. So as you can imagine, when you are 
coming out five years ago and we were at the time the only ones doing this particular uh, work. Uh, there were a lot of questions. Medical community is very proud community, but also very kind of sensitive to uh, newcomers. And they're like, you know, who are you guys? What data are you using? Is it all legal? Is it, is it not? Is it HIPAA compliant? And so it's kind of interesting just to learn and to communicate and to get, for example, doctors on our board um, and to develop this project. Um, right now, the part that I showed you is still a big part of uh, triage process, but now we have so many other things, including telehealth and scheduling and helping the reception with some administrative um, automation. So it's kind of like the full-blown IT service. Um, so this is where we are with, with the company. And I also like kind of contributing my knowledge in terms of my writings and my articles. So this is kind of like my hobby, as you probably know. So this is kind of a long story, but that's that's my story. Very interesting. So the outcome of this of this app should be either the algorithm would redirect you to a doctor or try to schedule an appointment or schedule a telehealth visit. What was what should be the outcome? Exactly. After this, there 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 is the workflow that, for example. You can schedule telehealth, you can chat with a nurse, or you can schedule office visits. So there are some options based on this information. So again, the idea is AI helps aggregate and summarize the data, but in the end, it's a lot about automation. You know, doctors are burned out, the reception desk is special during peak times, completely overwhelmed. As you know, phone calls go to voicemail, so now, by having the system, and again, we're not the only ones, obviously, but uh, just in general, having some kind of automated system helps doctors, helps front desk, nurses, patients, the whole ecosystem to streamline the process. So phone calls don't get uh, an answers because it's in the app, it's all within the app, it's, it's, it's automatic, you don't sometimes need to, to call the office. So um, the idea is that the office is not as overwhelmed and patients are happier. So this was the original idea. Again, in, in our vision, everything was perfect. You know, we, we're, gonna, we're gonna take over the industry. Um, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna help everybody. It's, it's gonna be great. The reality was a little different. First of all, there's, there's competition. There are a lot of innovators in the space. As you well know, digital health is full of Great ideas, uh, you know, gadgets, discoveries, um, and so at the time we and you know we still are pretty unique in how we do things, you know, alg algorithms. But obviously there are so many ways to automate things. And again, I've said this before in in my articles and in my in my posts on social media. It's not that the industry needs AI necessarily. It's just that AI oftentimes helps automate those processes that need to be automated in healthcare. So this is, uh, this is my story. One of the reasons you started your newsletter is to explore how healthcare works in this country. And your newsletter is called uh, Brutal, Brutally Honest Insights on AI and, and Digital Health. And I do hope that we're going to have a brutally honest interview today. Uh, but before that, I want to ask a different question from different perspective as a patient. Uh, how many years have you been living in, in the U.S.? Oh, I came in 1995, so it's been uh, 29 years. Almost 30 years. But for a person who, who has not been living here for the whole life, and you experience probably other health systems uh, around the world, as a patient, are you satisfied of the care that you receive in this country? So first of all, I came to America f for a reason. I was uh, escaping the regime that was far from free. And so uh, obviously thankful to this country that it provided to me. Um, uh, my, I've raised my family here. My two daughters were born here. So there's, there's nothing against the democratic system per se, or especially freedom, which gave my family and so many other immigrant families so much. Uh, but since you mentioned healthcare, yes, I have a privilege of comparing system we have in the US versus Europe versus, uh, you know, Belarus that 
that I had years ago. And um, I'm, I guess I'm surprised in the fact that how much progress has been done in this country to develop the technology to train the best doctors in the world. But then the system itself, in terms of how you get care, how easy to get access to care, all of those metrics just fail in comparison to other developed countries. And that's what bothers, bothers me a lot. And that's one reason I started uh, with my partner, this, this startup, and that's definitely the reason I started my newsletter. Um, because again, as you mentioned, as a patient, and I've just experienced that, I, I, I think I've, I've told you about a month ago, I unfortunately ended up in the ER and it kind of brought me back years because I haven't had this experience in a while. And so uh, just the whole experience, just the weight and how everybody's so burned out from the nurses, from admin staff, how hard they work, but seemingly getting nowhere. The particular hospital I was in completely overcrowded. They had you know, beds outside of the room. So I was actually in this kind of temporary facility they uh, set up there. Uh, I was there overnight. So I guess uh, it wasn't like the most serious case. Um, but it's funny, like, uh, it, it's interesting how great and hardworking the staff is, but then how bureaucratic the system is. You know, they have to make sure that the, the insurance accepts the claim, then obviously they, they don't accept right away. There's almost like this thinking, I think, in the medical com community that prior authorization is something that sort of magical, that uh, it gets denied at, at first, but then they look at it and, and then and they approve it. And it, it doesn't have to be like this. Uh, in other developed countries, at least from my experience and conversations from people who live there, um, physicians should be the final decision maker. It shouldn't be a clerk in Cigna or Aetna who decides, oh, this patient had this care. Well, you know what? I didn't think he needed or she needed this care. Even though there's a life physician who just um, looked at you and who looked at your medical tests, just like literally in your presence, and he or she made an educated decision based on their training, on the symptoms that the patient has today on the test that the patient just received. And then the fact that some persons in an office, often with no even medical education, just following some check marks, uh, 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 some, some predefined rule by that insurance company can just deny it. Uh, to me, it's kind of just doesn't make any sense. This doesn't happen in any country in the world. Um, so that bureaucracy kind of that what triggered me to speak up to write the newsletter um, again there are a lot of great things in this country in healthcare doctors are great nurses are great the most hard-working people in the industry but the system is set up against them against the doctors against the nurses against the patients um, and the system actually benefiting the most. It's the United Health. It's the Cygnus. It's it's the Epics, the Cerners. They're actually ripping the benefits of the system at the expense of of the patient. And that kind of really bothers me. And I'm in my kind of I guess work when I'm not doing my daily job. I'm trying to investigate why that's happening, how we can help. I'm actually involved with the. Well, I guess trying to be involved with some Congress people. Uh, sometimes I'm thinking, you know, maybe it's 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 the regulation. Sometimes I'm thinking actually um, regulation has nothing to do with this. So maybe it's some other parties that need to kind of decide uh, hard what we can do uh, with healthcare in this country. So a lot of questions, and I post this question in my newsletter, in my posts, uh, trying to involve people, uh, policymakers economists, data scientists, physicians, everybody who, who has any good idea, I'm always listening. Um, I'm happy to receive criticism. Uh, it doesn't matter. As long as the, at the end of the day, we, we help the system, we help our healthcare, we help patients, that's, that's what matters.
So sort of, sort of to back up your your previous answer, by 2000, health expenditures has reached about $1.4 trillion. And in 2022, the amount spent on health tripled to $4.5 trillion. According to CMS, healthcare spending in the United States is projected to rise from $4.7 trillion in 2023 to $7.2 trillion by 2031, growing by average of 5.5% per year. So, and you sort of talked about some of the problems. And yet, I don't think the increase of spendings correlates with the quality of care. So my short answer, my short question to you would be, what is going wrong? Yeah, so if you look at the United States healthcare system 50 years ago, it was much simpler. There was no waste or minimal waste, minimum bureaucracy. You know, the 60s and the 70s, basically the system you have, you get a symptom, you become sick, you go, you go to a doctor, you pay for his service, you, you go home. I feel like it's at that point where the financialization of the system started um, in the early 70s with the health insurance companies and later with PBMs, with TPAs, all these acronyms. But essentially, in a big picture, they're, they're middlemen between the patient and the provider. And the problem started when they become so big, and you mentioned the numbers, that they're actually the biggest part, part of healthcare, which is ironic. You know, you, you have doctors, you have patients, you know, where, where all these other parties come from. Um, so the moment this, this financialization started with objectives and goals right now completely, I feel like, or very misaligned with the social outcomes of healthcare, that's the problem. So the incentives of this middleman of PBMs, of health insurance companies, which is often the same group, group of companies, misaligned with what with the patient needs and with doctors needs. And that's a problem. If you, you mentioned those, whatever, 4.7 4 trillion now going into five or six trillion, big part, I think the numbers are like 25% is waste. It's, and it was documented so many times in, in so many studies. It's, it's the paperwork that these companies create. It's the um, uh, additional technology that has to be created to, for example, what, what I'm dealing with right now, my, my company is to have access to EHR records of the patients that we're serving, which is, you know, ridiculous. But the system makes it so difficult, so bureaucratic to have this access um, that it's actually become a huge part of this healthcare spending. So it, the patients paying out of their pockets, and big part of it is um, not only paying all these companies, all these executives, but also paying for unnecessary bureaucracy. And that's what bothers me in, a, in an era where we have great progress with AI, with all sorts of technology, with, with innovations. I feel like healthcare is left behind compared to other industries like tech and manufacturing and finance. Um, and I think a big part of the reasons are this monopolies, this huge spending that they create and that they benefit from at the expense of the rest of the industry of, of, of all of us. Um, it's a very unique problem to the United States. Um, as far as I know, um, none of the other certainly developed countries have this problem. And so you have this paradox. You have great people willing to do the work, and then you have this bureaucracy, this monopolies that are controlling the industry. And so the question is, what do we do about it? And that's what I'm trying to think about. Not always have all the answers, but this is what I'm addressing in my newsletters and in my postings in the interviews. Uh, so hopefully together we can find a solution. Talking about newsletter, uh, well, first of all, we'll definitely add the link and I highly recommend to subscribe because 
it's literally one of the best newsletters in healthcare I personally found so far. Over the last few months, you've co you've covered a lot of topics and news and scandals. Uh, I would definitely want to talk about pretty much every one of them, but we would need days or weeks to do that. But I decided to choose just a few of your of your recent posts, and I'd like to start with with something epic, epic EHR. Uh, your prediction is that potentially by the end of twenty twenty four. Epic is going to be hacked, considering that it's the biggest EHR system in the country with over 305 million uh, patients, it would be catastrophic. But I would like to discuss Epic from a different angle. I've been in the US a little over one year and I've talked to around 30 doctors, physicians, and I haven't met a single one of them. And to be fair, not all of them are using Epic but none of them are satisfied with the EHR system. So doctors are not happy. Potentially it has a lot of security breaches. It doesn't help to solve the problem of interoperability in this country at all. So the question is why do hospitals continue using it and some some of them switched to it recently? It's a great question. So by law, first of all, Providers and hospitals are required to have a system that are not only HIPAA compliant, but there are all sorts of compliance issues and particular parameters that have to be satisfied in, in order for a provider, for example, to store patient data and to have access to patient data. So this is where this whole industry started. Um, in terms of why everybody uses Epic or why Epic has so much control. It, it comes back to the conversation we had basically uh, for the last few decades, um, for better or worse, we've established a monopoly or to be more precise, an oligopoly in this country. Basically, it's a cartel, which is a group of companies controlling um, the industry. So EHR is no exception, EHR industry. And Epic is the biggest player there. First of all, I want to say that there are people who would dis disagree just completely with what are we talking about here. Um, there are people on <laughs> on both sides, I guess. I feel like just in my conversations, if you're already in partnership with Epic, you usually have seemingly more positive views on Epic. In other words, one, once you're part of the club, you kind of feel good about it. Um, you know, for example, you mentioned interoperability. Um, apparently, I was told that, uh, you know, within Epic, it's, it's, it's great. So if, if there's a hospital using Epic and the patient was there for some procedures and then in different hospital that also uses Epic, so two epics talk to each other. I mean, the problem is um, that there's so much f fragmentation in this country that once it gets outside of certain system, uh, then we have a real in interoperability problem. And that's, um, and that's, I think, the major issue. Uh, but you're right, epic, you know, is no, um, is no exception here. It's the, again, coming, going back to the monopoly. Um, once somebody has monopoly power, the incentive is to keep the monopoly power. And the way you do it is to either prevent innovation from coming, or if you see some innovation coming and you think, well, that's, that's inevitable, you kind of like either partner or acquire that, either startup or, or company. And this is what roughly what Epic has been doing. It's not not as many acquisitions, although they, they've had some. But it's this partnership. They have four partnership levels. Uh, you know, whatever it's called. It's almost like gold, silver, bronze, or something, which they call it differently. But uh, it's kind of interesting. And so they have this partners, and they've created this. They, they've created this um, illusion that they're 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 very innovative, because hey, look, we work with this startup, with that startup. Uh, but when you look inside, and, and you mentioned providers who actually work with the system, they don't see that innovation. 
so so something happens in in between um which is hard to explain but in the end of the day um again because epic is such a monopoly there's no incentive for them to make their system friendlier for providers it, it just so you know what why innovate why invest into system updates and te technological advances if in their mind providers have nowhere to go and providers also are tricked in, into this idea that well this is what what we're left with there's nowhere to go is because the same hr company companies keep saying well try building all this system from scratch you need to have it by law right you know we have all, all these laws you know um you know high tech act of 2009 uh, you know um the CARE Act a couple of years ago that kind of um, explain what providers should do with patient data. And they're like, well, you know, try dealing with that. But we, we're already there. And by the way, we have all this power, you know. So and let's, sorry for interrupting. Let's say, well, I'm personally, my, my team and I, I'm confident we can build the best HR out there with, which is gonna be user-friendly, efficient and super secured. But building the tech would not do it for me. Do I need like, I know, connections in Congress who would lobby the adoption of my EHR? What, what would a startup need to do in order to make this new HR that's gonna be much better than the previous ones be adopted in, in this country? Many ha have tried to build such systems and actually many have. Um, ChanMet, for example, is one of the more well-known ones, they have their own system. Um, I don't have all the answers, but the bottom line is that it's very difficult to sell this new EHR system when you have this, this, this monopoly control of epics of Cernus of this world. Um, you do, I mean, obviously lobbying wouldn't hurt. Um, in my opinion, lobbying has prevented innovation in, in digital health also. Uh, Again, for the reasons that, who are the main lobbies? It's the same group of companies. You know, Epic has one of the biggest lobbies. United Health, I think, has the biggest lobby in healthcare. They're the ones that are doing everything they have, including being experts on drafting the new law. Because, you know, when, when the new law is, is on the table, on the floor, who are they going to consult with the, with the Congress? They're going to the same companies like, oh, yeah, because we're going to make exact experts. So guess what? They're, the laws are drafted um, so that these companies keep their monopoly power. And if you're a new company, want to build an HR system, they're going to make it very difficult for you. It's not impossible, I don't think. Uh, but I feel like the innovators seeing the previous failures of the companies who have been trying to do it, they're looking at ChanMet that, you know, is, is, is a great company and uh, actually a large company. Uh, but in terms of market weight, especially in the HR industry, not that it's, it's their goal per se, but you look at HR and it's epic, 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 getting bigger, bigger and bigger. I think I've seen the numbers that in 2023, the new systems that were installed i mean the the all the new customers that epic uh, that ehr systems received 78 percent percent of them were epics customers so you're getting more new to 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 e not to mention the fact that they already control almost 50 percent of the market they're getting even more than 50 percent market share of new customers so that number is inevitably getting even, even bigger so, and, and that's in the end of the day the definition of monopoly again monopolies don't like innovation because that disturbs their monopoly power that's that's the definition uh, again i don't want to discourage anybody and obviously i'm kind of been trying my best to 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 innovate to bring the ideas of ai to this industry so there is no discouragement here but I'm just saying that that's the reality. What can be done about this is a completely different issue. And I write about this, I think, in, um, extensively in my, in my work. Okay, let's, let's talk about another complicated topic, primary care. Primary care is hard. In lots of cases, it's not profitable. And yet, so many big companies are still trying to get in and continue doing this mistake over and over again. 
Why? Well, um, there, there are many reasons. I think one reason is that if there is a big competitor that did something in primary care and failed, a uh, new big company comes in. So, so let's say, you know, CVS started something and they didn't have much success. Now Walmart comes in and says, well, we've been doing great in, in retail. You know, we are the ultimate masters of scaling and um, reducing costs. So how difficult could it be, right? So there, so there are a lot of sort of executives, they have this vision that if they did something in one area, this automatically translates into a different area. So they fall into the trap a little bit of the fact that they think that if they did something great um, in you know whatever areas or finance or retail, they can automatically do it in healthcare. And so that's 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 one reason. Another reason is that um, it's the way the corporations are, are structured. You know, they're, it's not one person who runs the corporation. You have the board, you have investors. If it's a big investor, that investor, well, actually likely to, to be on the board, but also likely to have an opinion on what the company should do. And so if you are a chief medical officer in a big corporation and you, and you know that primary care is hard, you know, from for a whole bunch of reasons, including financial and social outcomes. But then you have the board telling you, oh, you know, um, we have we have Amazon just 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 started one medical. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to conquer primary care. Why are we not doing that? And so, you know, if you if you start asking questions and questioning the board, you know, the way it works in many corporations, you know, you you may not end up in a, in a good place. So a lot of CEOs just basically yes men or yes women turned out to be, and they're they're going with this idea that, hey, you know, if if Amazon can do it or if if Walmart can do it, you know, we can do it. And so uh, there's a lot of this going on. But in the end of the day, I think my personal opinion is that. Um, all these corporations, they look at financial outcomes. I think healthcare is different in a sense that we have to look at, at the big picture. And the big picture is that um, helping patients is not only about financial outcomes. It's, it, it's, 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 it, it's a lot of aspects. It's, it's emotional. It's um, community. It's, uh, it's social. And, and so when you are very one dimensional, especially in, in primary care, which is, you know, the number one area, this is where people go if they have day to day issues. Um, it's hard. And, and again, I don't have all the answers, but I can kind of look back and explain why certain ideas or certain projects of these big corporations failed in primary care. Should we anticipate more newcomers in the space? Oh, yeah, it's it's the, uh, you know, like in the in the Wall Street movie, right? You know, greed greed drives everything. So uh, there are new executives come in um, with new fresh ideas. With new fresh ideas, <laughs> and they're like, "Oh, have we ever ever done primary care before?" <laughs> well, Walmart, by the way, this is their fourth time in the last, I think, like six years or something, where they started their healthcare division and. Um, and every time they think that um, you know they they can do it, um, in the end of the day, I think healthcare is local. You know, Walmart's problem, as far as I understand, was that they thought they can handle Medicare patients well, but in the end of the day. Medicare patients, most of them, obviously they're elderly, they have their own doctors. So now you're asking, oh no, we have this convenient location, Walmart. And by the way, we have like Walmart doctor now. Um, on paper, it was, it, it sounded great. Well, you, you get your groceries, you may as well get your care. Um, but 
with Medicare patient, it, it apparently it doesn't work like that. Um, elderly patients, they tend to like their doctors. They've been in many cases for decades with one doctor. They know where to go um, and they don't like the idea of being served in a, in a Walmart store, potentially with, with a different doctor next time. So I think there is a lot of, there's, there's learning curve even for these big corporations that have a lot of smart people, but si still seems to be learning. Um, so it's, it's an interesting area and primary care has to be solved. There are a lot of problems. Um, you know, the system is overwhelmed, burned out, um, financially strapped. And even though it looks like all these corporations throw in money, at the, at the companies, but somehow it's, it's the venture capitalists end up with all the money in the end, which is kind of interesting. Um, but again, if we think about the solutions, I think uh, we can come up with some good solutions. Uh, and when I say we, it's, it's the whole community. It's again, policymakers, medical community, academics. So I, I feel like we need to continue thinking we need to continue generating ideas um, but yeah corporations are gonna continue uh, kind of trying to expand their empire trying to conquer healthcare and in many cases they're they're gonna continue failing okay um, telehealth is another space which looks like things are not going well and no one is safe including teledoc and well and others we definitely saw a huge drop after the, the end of pandemic. But now what I see around the world, the number is actually growing in telehealth adoption. So why telehealth business is not doing well? I would say telehealth is doing extremely well. It's the part of the industry that focused on the so-called standalone telehealth. They are not doing so well. So the original idea with Teladoc was, was a great idea to essentially connect patients and doctors through, through video calling, which is not an, an original idea, but in healthcare, I guess they're, they're the first ones. So at the time, yeah, it was kind of interesting and uh, obviously early adopters um, started the industry. Um, but I think you know, that was, uh, was it uh, uh, 15 years ago? Uh, probably more than that. So over this 15 years, technology obviously progressed. Um, and now I think what's happening in tele telehealth industry is the, it's the customization. It's the way of providing telehealth as a tool as opposed to as a, commercial product. So initially there was this um, commoditization of telehealth and I, I think now it's more, it's become more streamlined. So I think if anything, telehealth is actually very popular, uh, especially after COVID, uh, obviously kind of that wave sub subsided a little bit, uh, but there's still like I, I use telehealth, it's, it's very convenient. In fact, there's a certain part of population that prefers telehealth, you know, why go, you know, drive somewhere when for certain conditions you can just talk to a doctor and uh, very convenient. Um, so again, the telehealth is dead in the way we remember it from 15 years ago. So we are talking Amwell, Teladoc, uh, there are a couple of others, but the new companies, the more what I call integrated platforms, they're the leaders in telehealth. So it's um, um, Deximity, even Hims and Her have, you know, telehealth uh, platforms. So it's, it's actually the names that are not household telehealth names, but they've already been in the industry. And at some point they're like, well, let's just add telehealth, right? Um, and again, it's not, as easy as ju just edit, so you, you have to integrate it. But in the end of the day, you wanna have telehealth in a place that you that you use every day anyway. So for providers, they use, for example, Deximity. Uh, it's sort of like sometimes called LinkedIn for medical professionals. So they come 
in the morning they open their computer, they already have certain systems. Uh, Veximity is one. Obviously, they have HR system open because this is what they do to uh, take their notes and to enter patient data. So I think HR companies will be actually very big in, in telehealth because, again, because of, of that convenience. Uh, so again, as I've been saying, stand, standalone telehealth is dead. But telehealth as a whole is is a very growing and um, area with with the future. Okay, interesting. You're one of you who actually in publicly criticizes VCs and their strategy, what you call uh, pump and dump. Can you tell our audience more about what the strategy means and help startups fall into that trap and what are the consequences? So let's start with 40 years ago. <clears throat> so that's when this idea of venture capital and private equity became popular. Uh, in fact, private equity back then was called differently. It was, it was actually called leverage buyout. And then they renamed it. So it's not as obvious that they're actually uh, borrowing money to, uh, to finance their, their deals. Uh, but in this case with venture capital, in the old days, I feel like they were more progressive in the sense that they would communicate with the founders. I guess founders reach out to them with with a pitch. They they're experts in what's happening in the industry, so they would say, "Well, yeah, you know what? This idea, the industry needs it. Let's implement it. So we're gonna give you capital. You know, here's the plan. Um, but you know what? You meet your benchmarks, and one of the benchmarks, by the way, was profitability. So, you know, uh, which is kind of interesting they're talking about ROI it's not necessarily profitability um, but back then they knew that for long-term growth of the company for sustainability at some point you need to turn profit you cannot just endlessly uh, burn the hole uh, in your balance sheet and so that was the idea back then and over time somehow it become became this um, almost like financial trickery. So what's happening right now, which I believe is criminal and, you know, I've had experience working on Wall Street and there it's um, obviously people go to jail for this kind of thing. Um, it's, it, it's very simple, but it's also very subtle. So it starts obviously with the, with the founder, right? So you're a founder, you talk to a VC and a VC says, Okay, we're gonna give you a million dollars, right? Um, so here's a million dollars, and we're gonna come talk in eight months. So they call it next round of financing. So uh, they may actually bring some of their venture capital, you know, friends in the next round. And VC bros. VC bros. Yeah. You call them. <laughs> the VC bros. That's right. And um, and so what's happening now is that. Oftentimes, it's not even about the idea. It's about how you market the idea. Uh, so you, you give money because, not necessarily because it's financially viable or even, um, you know, helping people, but just because it's, it sounds great. It sounds flashy. So you give capital for this idea. And because you get certain equity in return, there's Im implied valuation, which in many cases they, they don't talk about anymore because, you know, because of what's happening. And what's happening is every next round, typically, not always, they increase valuation, right? So if you talk about public markets like stocks, it's millions and millions of stockholders, people who buy and sell stock, decide on the price of the stock. What's happening in private financing, it's a bunch of venture bros decide on the valuation of the stock. So usually it's by the end of the financing rounds right before IPO, let's say, we're talking probably like 20 different venture capital firms. So we have this 10 to 15 to 20 venture capital firms sitting at the table at every round, essentially. I mean, I'm simplifying, of course. Um, but they're the ones who decide, essentially, by giving a certain amount of money on what the valuation is going to be. Right, but they still need to see the trajectory in the, in the business plan, right? Right, but 
because it's they they never look at pro I mean seemingly because we look at IPOs now um, I think 80 to 90 percent of uh, companies. digital health companies are now un unprofitable right. uh, Certainly in and, and actual technology overall, but certainly digital health, which is complete reverse from 50, uh, 40 years ago when it was actually 10 to 20 that were unprofitable. So one this complete, uh, almost like 180. So what's happening is that, to answer your question, when you give money to a founder, it's much, much easier, and actually with the VC's help, to by your customer, so to speak. So, you know, whether it's through ads or actually those VCs, they actually know people in the industry. So you go to them and say, hey, you know, we have this great technology. Can you become our customer? This is not organic growth. So by buying your customers and burning more money than the customers bring to you, you know, it, 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 it's not exactly an organic a growing business because an, an organic growing business is when you grow and as you grow, you, you become, especially in technology, hopefully, you scale more. You know? So you have digital health company, which is technology companies, and they don't scale. You look at their, at their balance sheet and they keep losing money. And so um, venture capital give you money, you increase your revenues because now you have more money to burn. So uh, the multiple becomes, the revenue multiple becomes more attractive, right? And so they raise even more money. And so this this vicious cycle of this, what I call artificial price inflation. So by the time, and obviously they need exit. Venture capital, it's all about the exit. Every time I talk to a venture capitalist, like first or second question is like, oh, what's, what's your exit strategy? So it's all about the exit, meaning that they usually have five to seven year runaway, so to speak, runaway for this one project. And after five to seven years, they're like, well, what are we doing now? We need to do IPO or something. And that's how all these digital health and profitable companies become IPOs. But the way the, the way the value at IPO usually it's they say, well, look, we have all the sales, right? Because they keep throwing dollars in, into, into, into the customers and, and they bring more customers like that. Don't look over here. Don't look at our cost uh, side of the, of the balance sheet, but look at the revenues, look at the multiples there, right? So this is... I mean, I'm simplifying. This is how, how they pitch. And so they have this massive valuations like on the way up. And then here they're going to IPO and saying to investment bankers, by the way, our last round was at, at this valuation rate. Uh, now with IPO, we're going to grow even more. So valuation should be even higher. But their reference point is some artificially created private valuation. And if it was on, on Wall Street, this, this would be called pump and dump because you are you have incentive to pump the price because you are the original investor in the company and so you pump in the price and then you look at the um at the financial statements all of a sudden a lot of the cvcs uh disappeared because they they exited this this was their exit it's not that simple obviously so so you know because they have a lock up period etc but there is a way to exit either through like later rounds of private valuation um and what's happening now, especially in, in digital health, is you know you have this pump and dump. You have pump on the way up, so to speak. Then you go to public markets. You know, public decides uh, on the value of the company, and they're like, "Well, the company is unprofitable. There seems to be a great vision, but like, um, and so, but actually, uh, those are more sophisticated investors. They kind of have." the sort of capacity, the resources to actually look deep down into the financials of, of the company. But the people who are suffering, actual retail investors, they're sort of mom and pop who are listening to this VC, who are listening to these investment bankers at the IPO round, who are saying, oh, this is the greatest idea ever, you know, invest with us. So the trading starts. And usually you have these retail investors who are buying in because they're listening to all this uh, pre-IPO rounds, how great the company is, but the sophisticated in, in investors and more and more uh, so-called short sellers, they're actually dominating the public markets right now and they're pushing the price down. And so you have this dump that not only coming from VCs right now, but from, sh from short sellers and from sophisticated investors who kind of know 
already what's going to happen because they've seen the previous pattern. Um, so again, it's not always the case, but it seems to be more and more in digital health. Now again, I'm the proponent and a believer that this is not legal. You know, they cannot do it. Um, why the regulators are not looking into this, I have no idea. But but again, I've done re some research on my own. There there are other people who are doing this, so uh, you know, I'm open to talking to to anybody and discuss this. But to me, it should not be happening. This is unfair. What VCs are doing, and and then of the day, they're becoming rich at the expense of retail investors and actually angel investors. Those are the investors who come in early, taking the most risk but don't get the benefit. And so this is another group that's suffering because of this later stage, what I call VC bros. Um, so that, that, that's, that, that's a big problem that um, needs to be resolved. Well, let's get back to AI, what we started with. Um, and I, since we don't have much time left, I'll go straight to my main question. So I, I often go to lots of startup events and I think around eight out of 10 startup founders are saying that they are AI startup. And when you start digging, most of them, not all, but most of them just basically connect to ChatGPT with the API to their product. Then NVIDIA is up 156% year to date with all the AI hype. A couple of weeks ago, a company called Tempus AI, and by the way, it was called Tempus just before they went public. Uh, they, and of course, they're also not profitable going to, to IPO. They, I, they have only 2% of their revenues related to AI-based features. So I personally truly believe that AI is gonna change the humanity for sure. But the question for you right now is in 2024, are we in AI bubble just as a dot-com bubble? It's interesting because there are so many definitions I've heard of the AI bubble and there's actually a good book um, and the author escapes me now, but I'll, 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 I'll give you the reference. They're actually talking about the AI bubble. So it, I don't think it's an AI bubble in a pure definition of uh, sort of irrational exuberance, so to speak, when the price just goes up so much that it's just the, the valuation doesn't kind of make sense anymore. Um, because if you compare it with like 1990s bubble, those companies, like majority of the companies didn't even have profits. They were just mentioned WWW and stock price goes up, right? So as now, as you said, most of the companies go public. Well, so let's talk about it because it's, it's funny you mentioned Temple CI because I have an article actually coming up, coming up hopefully tomorrow on this exact issue. <laughs> so it's kind of funny that, that you asked this question. So there is this dichotomy. There is a, so if, if you want to call it AI bubble, then it's definitely AI bubble that has two faces. Because if you look at the tech giants, basically a company who either bought GPUs or are making GPUs, especially if you're making GPUs, then you're, you're, you're definitely on, an, on a reap. So companies like Nvidia, there is a, also TSM, which is a Taiwanese, semiconductor that no one's talk about, but they also uh, make chips that are uh, related to, to GPUs and their stock prices are going up like crazy as well. But definitely NVIDIA in this country, people know about it. Um, so it brought the wave up, not only for NVIDIA, but for all of those big tech giants, as you know, who are using their GPUs. If you look at the multiples, they're nowhere even near. Like, I mean, by multiples, I mean, the price relative to whatever measure you want to use from their financial statements, whether it's revenues or gross profit, net profit, whatever. They're all extremely profitable. Um, they are making actually good margins on their AI uh, models, not obviously not as crazy margins as for their core business of data storage and, uh, and cloud computing, but they are making money. And so from that definition, I, it, it, it's just hard to see how that's a bubble yet. I think we may be getting there, but uh, it, it's a, it's an interesting question to, to discuss. But again, the, the other side is this AI startups. 
and I actually mentioned a few of them. You mentioned Temple CI. I actually identified in the very recent ones that when IPO, there are four companies, four startups that either have AI in their name or in their ticker, and all of them down. They're basically down from day one. So it's kind of funny that AI seems to be um, turning things golden if you're this big tech company already established, but it's, it's a kiss of death. The AI is a kiss, kiss of death if you're a startup trying to become a public company. All so, of them are down tremendously. So Tempest AI is down 30% in six days, as you know. So, so isn't that the, like, the first symptom of a bubble? And talking about NVIDIA, you mentioned that, yes, they're, they're making good profits, but so was Cisco in, in 90s with all the dot-com bubble. Yeah, I'm just comparing the levels. So if you just look at the price at, at price appreciation, uh, yeah, it's it's tremendous. I think just this year they want the, the Nvidia is up like two hundred percent. Not to mention, you know, f for the last couple of years. Um, but my point is, it's not at the levels, for example, at the tech bubble of 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 the nineties. We're not there yet. Um, but again. If you look at some of the definitions, some of the arguments people are making, I can totally see how we're getting there. Um, and to me, the main definition is that of, of a bubble is that when people hear something like AI and they just take it at face value without checking any facts about that particular company. Looks like that's what's happening. So by that definition, <laughs> maybe it's happening, yes. <laughs> At the very end, I ask my guests to give last piece of advice to startup founders in digital health. What would you recommend them to, to do or not to do in order to be successful? Well, I'm going to say exactly what I say in my newsletter. Be brutally honest with yourself. We mentioned venture capitalists. It's easier said than done, but be consistent with your vision, believe in your vision, and don't let anybody, including venture capitalists, change your vision. I love that. Thank you very much, Sergey. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. For more information, visit welleye.health.